Okay, good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, program, I won't have to ask if anybody's been to the 1893 World's Fair, right? I'm pretty sure I wouldn't get any hands on that. So I'll give you a little bit about the background of the fair before we get uh, into the details of the fair. Uh, first fair was held in Philadelphia in 1876. It was the first large-scale effort of the kind. And then you had St. Louis, Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. in contention for the next one, which was supposed to be in 1892. But as it were, it took them an extra year to get it finished, so it was started in 1893. At that time, the total Chicago population was 1,500,000, with one-third of the people were foreign birth. To give you a little background on that. Now they wanted an exposition to mark the 400th anniversary of Columbus sailing to the New World and promote the progress of man in science, industry, and culture since that historic event. The World Fair was epitomized to America in a world the inevitable betterment of mankind that would follow the embrace of civilization and science, the twin gods. The exposition covered more than 600 acres, featuring nearly 200 new buildings and canals and lagoons and people and cultures from around the world. Over 27 million people, and I still cannot believe that number, in six months. Over 27 million people, which is equivalent to about half the U.S. population, attended the exposition during a six-month run. Its scale and grandeur far exceeded the other world fairs. We must remember that the people of Chicago were still recovering from the Great Chicago Fire just 22 years earlier. The United States had a big showing in there, obviously, introduced to the world a wealth of inventions. The United States Post Office Department produced the first picture postcards and commemorative stamp sets, plus U.S mint commemorative coins, which never was done. Many food products, Cracker Jacks, Aunt Jemima syrup, cream of wheat, Quaker oats, shredded wheat, Paps beer, juicy fruit gum, and many more items were introduced at the fair, including a hamburger from Germany. Uh, zippers were introduced. And of course, as we see, the big centerpiece was a Ferris wheel, the first Ferris wheel and the largest ever built. And the Phosphorescent and neon lights were introduced. Milton Hershey introduced chocolate to the United States. Scott Joplin performed at the exposition, introduced ragtime to new audiences. And believe it or not, a group of hula dancers led to increased awareness of Hawaiian music. Uh, what's kind of interesting, James B. Clow. Anybody ever hear of James B. Clow? installed bathrooms in 32 locations throughout the fairgrounds and later maintained that this were the first paid toilets ever used in the fair. And that's quite something. <clears throat> Betterment, they did have other bathrooms in the fair, but this was uh, supposedly superior to the others. One must remember that the fair, despite its display of the greatest scientific and engineering breakthroughs, took place at the time when powered flight and the automobile had yet to be invented. Poet Catherine Lee Bates visited the fair and went on to write America the Beautiful, referring to the fair in the words, Alabaster Majesty. If you ever sing those songs, it refers to the World's Fair. Layered on top of the story of the exposition is a bizarre story of the serial killer H.H. H. Holmes who terrorized Chicago as the fair unfolded. A fascinating read, the white city, but later disproved. Michigan's contribution to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair were considerable. Natural resources and agriculture played a prominent role as well as a manufacturer of stoves. And we'll go into detail on that. So here were the people involved in getting it started. Again, this was uh, started at the national level, and then it was uh, parceled out to all the other states in the Union, and including the other countries as well. By 1890, it was clear that the U.S. Congress would have to decide where the fair would be held, and that the principal contenders, by virtue of their superior financial resources, would be Chicago or New York. 
New York's financial titans, including J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, William Walter Astor, pledged $15 million, and it went on and on. Finally, at the last minute, we had Lyman Gage raise a million additional dollars in a 24-hour period, and we got the World's Fair. So that's how it got started. Uh, as far as Michigan's interest in this, of course, Thomas W. Palmer, once a Michigan United States Senator, was a president of the Fairs National Commission. So he was on the top. And then he appointed people in every state, in every city to help participate in it. Okay, this is how Chicago looked, uh, looks today and how it looked back then. Uh, basically, what you had as a fair was down in Jackson Park, which was just a swamp. And the uh, idea was to get the trains, the elevated trains, to take the people to the fair, and also the Illinois Central would also bring the people to the fair. So that took the majority of it. What's kind of interesting about the site, that not only was it a swamp, it also was the site of Camp Douglas. Anybody know anything about Camp Douglas? Only 16 years earlier, Camp Douglas was a permanent prison of war camp from January 1863 to the end of the war, Civil War in Jackson Park. Eventually came to be noted for its poor conditions and death rate of between 17 and 23 percent. Eighty Confederate prisoners and 240 Union Army trainees and guards had died at the camp. And this was just 16 years prior to the thing there. And somebody asked me what happened to the camp. Well, it disappeared. It's an interesting read if you ever have a chance to read about Camp Douglas because uh, it had a history onto its own. Uh, Jackson Park, 1.3 miles of Jackson Park Swamp, transformed into a fabulous white city of classic buildings, statues, and fountains for a six month period only. The Chicago Exposition was in part designed by Daniel Hudson Burnham. You all heard of Burnham Park in Chicago, right? and Frederick Law Olmsted, who also designed Central Park in New York. And this is the way they planned it. The whole park would be uh, right here. You had a pier, you had all these lagoons in there, and then you had the Midway. University of Chicago is now here, and this is now called the Midway Plaza, but this is the carnival part of it. This was not approved by the founders of the fair. They kind of looked down upon it. They, this is the very first carnival in the world, by the way, that they set up right here. And the founders wanted nothing to do with it because they were there to, again, promote uh, engineering, science, and art. As it turned out later on, it was a carnival that saved the budget on the whole thing. But uh, this is what it looked like when they got it planned. <clears throat> Bernard headed up a selection of the Board of Architects who conceived the general design of the fairs buildings and the Court of Honor, as well as the architects who would carry out the design and construction of the 200 additional buildings. By 1891, over 40,000 skilled laborers and workers were employed in the construction. How many here would like to supervise 40,000 workers? It's truly amazing. They got that done in two years. Frederick Law Olmsted was well, on the board of architects who were a group of Eastern architects generally trained at the Academy des Beaux Arts in Paris, decided on the unusual fair plan utilizing the natural landscape of Jackson Park. What Olmsted did was create a system of lagoons and waterways fed by Lake Michigan. These bodies of water served as a decorative reflecting pools, waterways for transportation, and provided a place of respite necessary for weary summer visitors on the shady wooded island. The 14 main buildings surrounding the waterways were in the Beaux Arts, French neoclassical style with its emphasis on logic, harmony, and human formity. Architects trained at the Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris. The Court of Honor buildings surrounding the Grand Basin with massive gilded statue of the Republic were intended to be temporary. And this is a hard thing to believe. Everything you're going to see today was just the last six months. Actually, the Eiffel Tower was made the last six months, but it's still around today, right? They were going to destroy that after the fair. The facades were made not of stone, but of a mixture of plaster, cement, and jute fiber called staff. 
which was painted white, giving the building the magnificent whiteness and dazzling visitors who arrived at the rail terminal just outside the fair gates. So this is the plan. This is the way it was supposed to be. Again, Mr. Olmsted designed the lagoons you see there, the wooded island. He made use of the swamp area. And he had an entrance to and from Lake Michigan right over here. So this was a whole plan that Carnival Midway ran this way. Again, that's where the Chicago University of Chicago is today. This is Mr. Olmsted. And this is what the park looked like when they got started. It was just a swamp and they got the uh, workers together. And you have to wonder how that would ever turn into a World's Fair like no other. Of course, they didn't have any gasoline engine, trucks, cars, or anything else. Everything that was done by horse and uh, wagon, just pretty much like on a farm. Here's your workers all lined up with their wheelbarrows waiting to do their thing. But as they went along, uh, it uh, had snags here and there. You have to keep in mind, too, this was during a deep recession. So those 40,000 workers needed work. It also was a short time before the Pullman strikes in uh, South Chicago. So it was a very volatile time. They were lucky to get the workers what they did. And these are what the designs looked like for the buildings. To hasten the painting process, Francis Davis Millet invented the spray painting. The next time you do spray painting, you have to thank the World's Fair because he had to get things going. Again, all these are made on a lath and plaster. Made from designs, just like you see right here. Architectural critics derided the structures as decorated sheds. Louis Solomon was completely against the style. Burnham decided to allow spectators into the fair compound, paying a fee of 25 cents to watch the progress of construction. Now, that is intelligence over there. 3,000 people visited per week and paid a admission just to see the fair being built, just like you see here. This is what the lagoons looked like before they got all done. To give you some idea of the extent of the project, 75 million board feet of lumber 18,000 tons of iron and steel, 120,000 incandescent lights, 30,000 tons of staff, 14 main buildings with a total floor space of 63 million square feet. And that was all done in two years. The construction process was slow, but they finally met the date that they wanted. Some of it was on finish that opening day, as we'll see, but this is the workers leaving. You can see the skeletons of the administrative building as they left. And this is what it was all about. You got the, just like you had in your house. You had the lath and plaster, and then you had some uh, little ornamentation like you see there. This is your spray paint. If you ever use spray paint, you thank the World's Fair. They had to use that in order to get the job done. Then you have these tremendous artists. The artistry is just fantastic. They were imported from Europe, and they were the ones that uh, did all the fine sculptures that you see there. One of the problems they did have, they had a rough winter in 19, 1892 to 1893, which kind of slowed them up. In addition to the numerous buildings and structures that needed to be completed inside the fairgrounds, additional hotels, apartments, and other buildings were required to house thousands of tourists and workers. And I had a young lady contact me the other day, Edna Farthing, said her grandfather was hired to manage a dining room in a temporary hotel in Chicago during a fair. It was called the Kalamazoo Columbian House. A group of Kalamazoo County men formed a company and built a hotel for people from southwest Michigan and their families and friends from other areas to stay when they attended the fair. The hotel registry still exists and has been indexed and digitized. So if you had anybody that attended the World's Fair, they might have their entry in there. Now look at the size of these statues that they were making. Again, this was strictly out of plaster. They weren't the stone sculptures. This particular uh, building front that you see right here was going in front of the agricultural 
building. The only other, there are two permanent buildings built. The one permanent one on the fair itself, of course, was the, what we now know as the Museum of Science and Industry that was made with brick and steel. Later on, they took off the stucco and they replaced it with stone to make it look exactly the way it did. The other one is the Art Institute of Chicago. And that was the only building outside of the fairgrounds and that was used for all the planning of the fair. So next time you go to the Art Institute of Chicago, that was part of the World's Fair. Well, the big uh, celebration started and it started in New York. Somebody asked me, was this a local type of thing? This was a worldwide thing and uh, New York celebrated as well. And these are all the ships that they had coming into the New York Harbor in order to celebrate the dedication of the fair, which was uh, momentarily. The fair celebration started in New York with ships in the harbor and parades in the streets. Replicas of the Nina, Pinto, and Maria were sailed to New York from Europe. And later on, this is the ships as they looked in the uh, World's Fair. As a matter of fact, you could get postcards in the 1930s that still show those replicas there, and then eventually, of course, they were scrapped. But those were, they sailed those to Chicago via the Erie Canal. There was no St. Lawrence Seaway at the time. So they were brought by the Erie Canal into Chicago and were one of the high points of the thing there. Dedication ceremonies, October 20th, President Grover Cleveland gave the opening speech at the dedication at the fairgrounds. This is a parade they had in New York. They didn't have any ticker tape at the time, so uh, you had to do with all the people that uh, attended. Never had people witnessed such a spectacle, or rather a series of spectacles, at once so dignified, brilliant, and impressive. This is Chicago. This is over at State Street. All the celebration. Michigan Avenue, all the celebration that they had there. At the dedication, thousands of invitations had been extended, including, among others, the President of the United States and his cabinet, Vice President, ex-Presidents Hayes and Cleveland, judges of the Supreme Court, and on and on. All the dignitaries were invited to celebrate. And this is another view in Chicago of the decoration they put up there. On a gray autumnal sky ushered in the morn of the 20th, when half a million of Chicago citizens filled the streets of every point of vantage, they had 80,000 people march in the parade and review past the Vice President of the United States. So it was quite a big thing. This is the scissor that they used to uh, dedicate. And this is the group that was there at the dedication, all to see the uh, uh, opening of the fair. What's kind of interesting in the parade is that the Mexican Republic was the most positive force we had in getting the fair going. They were no ferret pontinate, has displayed a deeper interest in the World's Fair and they had wide, dis wide participation in that. There's Mr. Cleveland right there. <clears throat> So they had a lot of people involved in there. At the dedication, they was one of the earliest public recitations of the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States flag, written earlier that year by Francis J. Bellamy. So that was the first. When you say the Pledge of Allegiance, one of the very first times was when they had the World's Fair. No military groups were allowed on the fairgrounds. So when they had the parades inside the fairgrounds, they used the police. And that's how many police they had all suited up there, marching for the dedication. And this is what Chicago looked like at the time. Again, this is only a few years after Chicago fire. Anybody like to direct the traffic there? I studied a picture. I don't think I see a policeman any place. You got horse and carriages. You got a whole line of trolleys going every direction. Well, a lot of people ask, how did anybody ever get over there? Well, they got there by the Illinois Central Railroad was one of the uh, ways that they got over there. 
People complain that they were uh, being treated like cattle. But then you have to keep in mind that when the people came in, they handled 43,000 people at a time on 35 tracks coming in from the Illinois Central. 35 tracks. And the people were going on there. Well, I guess it would be like cattle cars when you have 43,000 people at a time brought in a fair. And of course, they also made use of the elevated. And the elevated came in. What they did, here's all your railroad tracks, 35 railroad tracks from the Illinois Central. And then they had the elevated came in and they would transfer from here to the very first electric elevated train that took them all around the park. This is what the train station is. This is uh, where the people came in off the train. And just a uh, precursor, this is also where the second fire started at the uh, World Fair. And this is what the people saw when they got off the train and went inside. They were just overwhelmed. They couldn't believe what they saw. Again, this is where the elevated. The elevated came right down here to the uh, fairgrounds. Illinois Central ran right by there. That, this is your elevated at the time. They didn't have electric elevated. It was all by steam. And so the World's Fair was the very first one to have the electric elevated. You came in by your steam train right here. You transferred over to the electric train over there and you rode around the park. You had a complete loop. This here shows how the electric elevated around the park. You started here, you went around, you looped around, you could go all the way this way, you came over, looped around, traveled about uh, two miles. And like I say, this is the first one in the world that they had electric elevated train. It was three miles long with a turning loop and electrically charged by a third rail, something that was unheard of at the time. And this is what it looked like. You got in that train and oh my gosh, you're going by electric, there's no smoke, no pollution, no more balky steam train. And from there, just, just as a passing note on this, you see all the windmills they had on display over here, which was one of the biggest exhibits they had there. They couldn't believe to see all those whirling windmills that were there. And if you went by carriage, or walk, you got in the gates here and you had your, all your different tickets that were designed by the time when you went in there. And this is what you saw when you went in there. Mr. Olmsted did his job. He turned the swamps into the beautiful lagoons like you see right over here. He had these sculptures all made out of plaster. Paris not meant to last more than six months. Beautiful jobs. This is the statue of industry that they had on one side of the basin. This was a statue of plenty. And over in the middle, you got the republic that was gilded. They had an electric motor on a boat, something people never heard of before. They could get around the lagoon. You got the Paris style behind that. Again, that's plaster of Paris as well. And then you got the Hershey building. They called this the chocolate building. He found out somebody in Switzerland was making chocolate and he was making caramel candy at the time. So he got the machines over to his chocolate building and he made chocolate candy, something that people had never had before. And just from a machine he had just recently bought from Switzerland. The Paris style, again, you had a way to get your boat out to Lake Michigan. And they had a Columbus Quadriga on top of the peristyle. The basin again, the head of it, that's where the Quadriga was, right on the top. Look at those columns. I look at them, I'm just astounded. Make those out of the plaster of Paris, just as magnificent as could be. Over on the other end, you had the administration building. Administrative building was uh, had a replica of the Liberty Bell in it. It was made from uh, melted metal. Everybody donated from across the country to make the replica that you see right there. And you get the second story of the building and you see this magnificent 
sculpture. If you want to know what it looked like in the studio, this is what it looked like. It was a sculpture and they put it right on top of there. It's on the administrative building. They had the Columbia Guard. Now these were people with no authority whatsoever, but they sure looked good in uniform walking around. Most of them could not speak English, but the people felt very secure when they saw them uh, in the various places of the fair. Now let's start with the agricultural building. This is what it looked like when they were building it. And a little description of it is that between the annex and the central traverse nave of the main hall are the exhibits of the various states of the American agricultural schools, experimental stations, and several minor foreign countries. Fronting on this nave are the pavilions of the leading agricultural states, including Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We're in there. And they go in the door of the agricultural building and see the Corinthian Temple. This is Michigan's exhibit. It was in center of the Michigan section, surmounted by a shield bearing her coats of arms. Above the main entrance is represented a family group, which is right up here. <coughs> Fashioned in corn and wheat, it's four members on their way to the harvest fields. And a lot of people think of Michigan in uh, automobiles, but in fact, they were very great in agriculture. And the, some of the features that they had right there, let me find a second. Oh. They had, they had beans and rye and uh, about every time a crop, they were also noted for the type of, uh, of ground that they had. They had very fertile ground and all different types all over the area in Michigan. So they had a very central part in the agricultural building. They were also, of course, they were known for the apples. And uh, they uh, were in competition with New York and both New York and Michigan are mentioned as far as uh, the apples that they produce. So they were very well represented in the agricultural area. You get right next door, you get to the machinery area that you see right here. And right in the front of there, they got a statue of Christopher Columbus. And again, you have these uh, majestic columns that you see right there that uh, uh, really make you feel grand before you ever get in there. And this is the propeller from the one of their ships that they had there, the Spree. Just give you some idea of how they had progress in machinery around the world. And again, this was a German exhibit that they had. So it's, it's quite a fair just to uh, elaborate on a little more on what the agriculture in uh, Michigan. The exhibits came from all portions of the state whose surface and soil are greatly diversified and hence are of a miscellaneous character, including wheat, corn, oats, rye, peas, beans, buckwheat, timothy, and clover, with many varieties of seeds, nuts, vegetables, and a small display of melons. Most of these descriptions are taken right out of the guidebook that the people had when they went in there. Agricultural exhibits include apples plus diversified crops from throughout the state. Between the two divisions of California exhibits are scores of long tables, covers with groups of apples, including Russet, Ben Davis, Northern Spy, and their kindred from all the states, including New York and Michigan. So Michigan was very prominent throughout there. Well, we're gonna go out to the next building. Louis Sullivan was totally against this backward step he thought they were taking with these uh, French styled buildings, stucco buildings. He was the only one to come up with a building like you see right over here. And that was called the Polychrome Proto-Modern Transportation Building. The only building that stuck out from the rest of them. And inside they did not have automobiles, they had the horse and carriage which a lot of people are surprised. Again, that wasn't, uh, uh, auto wasn't heard of yet. 
Premiums are awarded on such points as soundness and serviceness of the animal, construction and adaptability of the vehicle and harness, general condition of the animal. And the companies that won the competition were included Marshall Field and Company, the best team of horses. Now, I don't know if you have shopped at Marshall Field and Company, but you probably never thought of them having horses and wagons in a contest. This here, you find a Studebaker wagon. If you ever get to the Studebaker Museum in South Bend, they have that very carriage in their museum. It's very fancy. It's made out of mahogany. It's got the uh, uh, brass trim on there. Very, that was Studebaker. And if you had noticed when we got on the train getting down to the fairgrounds, they had Studebaker in the big sign on top of the building because they were the largest maker of wagons in the world at the time of the World's Fair. And here's another case here, you got the Studebaker. You had the ships, this is before the Titanic. They had the models of the ships. If you wanted to take a ride on the White Star, this is what your compartment would look like. Again, the railroad, this is a transportation building, 35 tracks coming in there, plus they had the exhibits of the trains outside. This is a photo they took. You see the 35 tracks coming into the transportation building right there. And they had the Queen Express. This train was brought in from England on exhibit. The 999 steam locomotive, which you can see in the Museum of Science and Industry today. Fastest land Vico reached a point record of 112 miles per hour. That was a part of the New York Central Empire State Express that they had. You had the military general that was used in the Civil War. You had the train that you see right over here that's called the John Bull, the original. D. Witt Clinton, the pioneer of New York Central. And Pullman showed the luxury of cars. You didn't have airplanes, you didn't have buses. You had these luxury cars, just like you see right there. As a matter of fact, Pullman had special trains that took the people to their plant nearby to show their social experiment and community, which started the whole Pullman riot later. That's another story. But this is the type of thing that Pullman supplied in your luxury when you took the New York Central over to New York. Pretty fancy. Well, you get outside the transportation building and we go a little bit to the uh, north over there. They had the uh, Coral Hall. Look at that Coral Hall. We should have a symphony hall like that. Beautiful. This is where all the, uh, they had a lot of German choirs sang in there, United States choirs all from all over the world sang in the Coral Hall. Horticultural building wasn't finished at the time that the fair opened up and the people got to see it while they were finishing it. And if you were there before they opened the fair, you had to charge, charge you for looking at a building, but that's what they looked like. After it was done, this is what the horticultural building looked like. Inside you had plants from all over the world. The woman's building. This was built to honor the woman. Now, you don't, don't think too fast forward on this. This was just the uh, activists that were great in uh, uh, what they were doing in the women's cause, but they still promoted cookbooks and uh, taking care of the children and, and taking care of the home. But this is the women's building dedicated to them. Again, this is a view from the balcony. This is the Illinois building in the back there. This is what it looked like inside with all the fancy artwork on the top. And these are already the activist women who uh, furthered the cause of women uh, on this page. Then they had right next to it the children's building. Here this is called the children's crutche. That's what it's called. This is nurseries here and in the World's Fair of St. Louis. One of the biggest exhibits were watch the incubators with babies in them. For some reason, everybody got fascinated. And here's an example right over there. Then they had the children classes. You got to sit in on those. And they had the kitchen garden. 
These were the young ladies that were uh, trained for household duties. You can see them holding their brooms and so forth. And of course, the kindergarten is the, uh, the child garden that's starting a school, and the kitchen garden is for the people that are learning to do domestic type of work. Well, we're over here, transportation building, the women's building. Now we're going to start over here and see where Michigan really shines again. And this is in the mines building. And right in front of the mines building, they got a horse that was sculptured called Proctor's Indian. Michigan was the largest producer of copper, earning it a special place of honor in the mines building, fronting on a central court and with the largest space allotted to any of the state exhibits. Among the materials used for a pavilion are specimens of building and ornamental stones with other minerals taken from Michigan mines and quarries. The archway is a native sandstone, a stone-like interior lined with copper, on which are displayed the mineral products of the states fashioned in the form of shields, with a coat of arms on medallions, and above all, an allegorical group representing two miners with the presiding genius of the industry as crowning a wreath. These are the write-ups I'm reading from their tour book. As you came up to this building here, this is how they extolled the Michigan. Fronting on the native central nave is a large diagram showing a cross-section of a mine operated by the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Company and representing its geological formations with a system of shafts sunk to three successful levels before the ore body is reached. So these are all the different types of exhibits. On two of the interior walls are pictures of more prominent mines in Upper Peninsula as a Pittsburgh, Barnum, and Salisbury, around which are heaps of timber and snow-covered piles of ore. The famous Calumet and Hecla mines and the stone quarries of Marquette are also reproduced in graphic art, and among scenic views are those of Lake Angeline before its waters were drawn of and of Todd's Harbor and Isle Royal. One of the exhibiting companies shows the levels of its mine and sheets, it's right here of glass, in which are indicated the location of drifts and tunnels, while elsewhere are models of machinery, mills, and reduction works. Michigan's display of minerals is both interesting and instructive, again, per the, per the book that they had there. There are samples of gold ore found near Isfeming, a saying $10,000 to the ton, the silver ores, marble of different kinds of colors, verde antique and serpentine, and granite and whetstones. These specimens are for the most part taken from private collections, as are also graphite, fire and common clay, fire, sand, coal, all of this from Michigan. And the big thing that they had there was the largest mass of native copper weighing 8,500 pounds. Now, how you weigh anything that's 8,500 pounds, I don't know, but I'll take their word for it. That's 8,500 pounds. And they even go into prehistoric tools that were used to mine copper, of course, up around Copper Harbor and Isle Royal uh, thousands of years before we came there. So that was quite a, quite a demonstration of Michigan over there. Right next to it was the, the electric building. They, right here. It was a historical moment at the beginning of a revolution as Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse introduced the public to electrical power by illuminating the exposition. There was a contest between Thomas Edison and Westinghouse as who's going to light the fair, and Westinghouse won out because Edison was still toying around with direct electricity, whereas Westinghouse was in alternating current. And who's a better person to have in front of the electric building than Benjamin Franklin? Right? He had the kite that went up in the air and a lightning struck the kite. So they thought that he would be a very good uh, example for electrical uh, building. They had electric fountains on the outside. And this is what the people who never saw a light bulb in their life came to see. They had uh, Edison, who later would be General Electric, and uh, Tesla, who later would be West Westinghouse, and they also had Western Electric were there. So these are giant people who had never seen this. They had giant alternator current generators in there. This is Mr. Tesla. 
He's the one that installed the generators in Niagara Falls. It's something that was never done, and this is Mr. Westinghouse over here. Now look at here. We're talking 1893. Look at the big machinery they have there, the alternators. Just amazing. Keep in mind, this stuff has to be moved out, and six months later, it had to be moved out. And the, the work that it took to organize, they had over 5,000 exhibits. And somebody had to organize who's coming in and who's coming out. But look at the giant machinery. They moved in their electrical machinery. I showed this exhibit a short time back, and a gentleman came up to me, and he says his grandfather, Max Kruger, from Berlin, an electrical engineer working for Siemen, actually designed the bulb that you see on this slide. And uh, he was very proud of that, which he should. This is the first time that you had fluorescent bulbs, which later, of course, would be the fixtures that we're known today. People had never seen anything like that glow before. They had the American Bell Telephone Company. And they had Edison's phonograph. The young lady is using her phonograph, if you can believe that. And then, of course, outside, I mentioned they had electric boats. And then you have the largest building in the world at the time of the fair. And that's a manufacturer's and liberal arts building. Largest roof building in the world at the time stood over 19 stories high. It required over 7 million feet of lumber for the flooring alone. Now get this, five rail cars of nails, 12 million pounds of steel, 30,000 panes of glass, and 50 tons of paint. And the tragedy when they had the big fire, all 30,000 panes of glass came crashing down at one time, which was quite a horrific sight to see. But this is what the, it looked like from the outside. This is what it looked like when they were building it. Just so you look at it today and you can't believe. Uh, just a little side note, I missed it before. One of the workers on the construction of the fair was Walt Disney's uncle. So I have to wonder if he sometime later would uh, uh, pass the word down about how great the fair was, but uh, Disney did work on the, uh, on the construction. This is how huge it was, nine stories high, never done, been done before. They had to figure out how to put a light fixture out there, and they had an elevator that went up and down for the entertainment of the people. Going to have to change the slide tray one second, bear with me. Okay, so this is a huge building. This is a little floor plan about all the work they had to do about uh, telling all the dealers where to be. And this is what it looked like when it was finished. An amazing part of this is a Yerkes telescope. You probably heard of that. It's still around today. It was so huge that it had to be assembled inside the building because it would have needed a five-story door to put it through. And the irony is that this was completed just before the fair opened. They put it together, and it was the largest telescope at the time. And here we are at a Garland stove. How many ever saw the Garland stove over in Detroit area that they had? It was there until last summer when it burned. But uh, this is a Garland stove. <coughs> and what they indicated is that the as a major stove, stove manufacturer, the Michigan Stove Company has in a shape of a mammoth stove, one of the most unique exhibits on the floor in the manufacturing building. It got the attention of all. And this is from the brochure, the guide that you read. The people are under the Garland stove. 
the large space devoted to stoves, furnaces, ranges, and steam and other heating appliances indicates the magnitude of these items of manufacture. People had never seen Magnificent, and these stoves were used for heating. They were not used at the time necessarily for cooking. So the garland stoves were designed and manufactured in the late 1800s through 1955 by the Michigan Stove Company. And they made this 15-ton wooden replica that you see right over here. And these are all the advertisements for the garland stove, which was quite the thing at the time. And this is what it looked like when it was in Detroit for many, many, many years. But like I say, last uh, summer it burned, and that's all that's left. It was 15 tons of wood. I don't know if they plan to build it again. You also have the huge tire, of course, you see when you come into Detroit. Of course, Kalamazoo Stove Company from 1902 to 1952 was the uh, big manufacturer as well. The Kalamazoo, direct to you. But that wasn't uh, in business until after the fair here. Of course, they were the ones that invented the oven door window and the thermometer mounted on the oven door, something we all use today. But to give you some idea who was exhibited in there, uh, we had the uh, companies including Tiffany's. We had uh, Tiffany, American cut glass, garland stove, German porcelain, French porch, and they actually had Mary Antoinette's bed. If you missed everything else in the fair, you wanted to see her bed. But as far as Michigan knows, it was also partly a liberal arts building. It had exhibits which described Michigan's role as a leader in the development of the teaching of the deaf. And that was through the University of Michigan. So that was another Michigan item, and this one was in the liberal arts part of the show. Then you had the Government Center, and this was the first picture postcards, first U.S. produced commemorative stamps, and first U.S. mint commemorative coins were made at the time. This is the inside. They had a stump of a redwood tree and all those beautiful paintings all around. Coins from their mint coin collection. A mail car for baggage stamps, and these are the postcards that they had. People had never seen a picture postcard. Anybody remember what a postcard is? You don't see too many of them anymore, do you? It's something you used to put an address on and give a message and, and send it in the mail, but this is the very first one that they had. Well, that was the government building. Now we're going to this section. You're familiar with it because this is where the Museum of Science and Industry is, is today. And we're going to where they had the foreign buildings. This is interesting here. This is by France. This is a Cafe de la Marine, which was a seafood place. Isn't that wonderful? How many here would like to eat oyster that was shipped by train for a couple of weeks from the East Coast? I, I think I would not. But this is a big oyster place and everything else. But right next to it, they had the foreign buildings over here. And probably the most outstanding was the Brazilian building. Just fabulous. Again, plaster and, and lath is all it is. German. The German one lasted all the way through the 30s, 1930s. You can get postcards with it. I don't know if that's because about a third of the population was German in Chicago or not, but uh, there's a German building and it stood for many, many years. They had the fishery building where they promoted fishing throughout Michigan and so forth. And in the center they have what they called the Wooded Island. And the Wooded Island had the Japanese exhibits. Again, we were friends there in uh, 1893 and they had their officials come from Japan to dedicate their building. And then you had the state buildings all in this section here. This is part of that the elevated electric train that kind of loops around, that gets around there. And this, my friends, is the Michigan State House. It earned a prominent place in the fair State House section of the fair. That State House was furnished with, of course, furnishing and tile produced by Michigan's leading manufacturers. 
20,000 Michiganders attended the opening of the State House. And I mentioned earlier about that uh, hotel that was built just for Michiganders coming in there. For Michigan's home adjoining that of Ohio, a choice location was assigned west of the Art Palace and fronting on two of the boulevards. A balcony clock tower raises a height of 130 feet. Attractive apartments are those finished and furnished by the Saginaw, Muskegon, and Grand Rapids. The first in the form of the men's reception and reading rooms and the ladies' parlor. The special creation of the latter is tastefully decorated in stucco and hung with beautiful tapestries designed by the women of that city. While in its furniture, the leading factories present their finest products. From Grand Rapids also comes the carved marble mantel in the main corridor, 50 feet in width. This is again from the tour book. The floor, together with those of the minor passages, being paved with Michigan tiling. On the floor is an assembly room for social, musical, and religious gatherings in which the handsome pipe organ constructed by a Detroit firm across the corridor is natural history collection from the State University consisting of deer, bears, birds, reptiles, and other specimens. So this was the Michigan State House. New York State also had a state house there. They had the original lions out there made by a famous artist. And this is what it looked like in the parlor inside the New York State House. Plaster and lath. Philadelphia building. It actually had the original Liberty Bell in the Philadelphia building. There it is right there. And then across from there, of course, is our Museum of Science and Industry that was uh, uh, designed by Charles B. Atwood. And he also was uh, involved in many other design in the area as well, as was Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham uh, designed a merchandise mart field building Union Station, Wrigley Building, and the Civic Opera House, and Marshall Field and Company designed all that before he designed this. This is a Taylor's building, by the way, and you have the lagoon going up to the... This kind of looks familiar to you because this is what the museum looks like today. But at that time, it was the Palace of Fine Arts, and the entrance is at what we call the back and not the other side. This is where you went in because that's where your boat hung out right there. And this is one of the guides for that. What it looked like. And this is what you looked at when you went inside. Look at those paintings. These are U.S. oil paintings. People sat for hours looking at them. As I indicated at the beginning, the promoters of the fair were extremely disappointed because not all the people were culturally inclined. As a matter of fact, 80% of the people would go to the fairgrounds, to the carnival, and about 20% probably in these fine exhibits. These are paintings and arts from all over the world. This is French paintings. Just a magnificent collection of oils. This is a Dutch, if you have uh, people in, uh, from Holland in here. And this was a fine uh, Brazilian artist made this figure of Christ. Then you got the Buffalo Hunt by Bush Brown, Charles Dickens, and Little Nell. There's another, some of the things here. Again, they were very disappointed because they did not get the people there that they wanted to. Well, you get over here, and what you're going to do now is kind of go around the shoreline to the outside. And this is Lake Michigan. Chicago's over here. And they did have the uh, Victorian house that was part of the international houses here. And then the people would stroll along the lake. Over here was a wood copy of the battleship Illinois. Again, they did not allow any military equipment or people there. So they actually reconstructed that. We'll see that in a minute. But here's people bathing on the, on the shoreline. You can see they have everything covered up properly. You wear a red neck if your neck would show up or your, your wrist, so you covered everything. This was on the beach. And this is, again, that electric elevator went around there, and you walked along the beach. This is the French building that they, France built right here, and we're going to make our way right along the 
shoreline. This is French. The French built that building over there. They had a life-saving station, and guess who manned that? That was manned by the Ludington Lifesavers, manned the life-saving. They gave demonstrations every day for the people coming through. They had the Viking ship. This one came all the way from Norway via New York and the Erie Canal to the Great Lakes down to here. And if you want to see that today, you go to the town of Geneva in Illinois, and that is one of the survivors. But that's a Viking ship. And the battleship Illinois that was made completely out of wood, full scale, because they would not allow a steel ship in there. So that's the Illinois. And probably one of the very interesting ones is a moving sidewalk at the pier, so people wouldn't have to walk to and from the boats. So they had that on there. At the close of the exposition, he had carried 997,000 people on that moving sidewalk that you see right over there. And they would take you to your boat. It would carry 6,000 people at a time, six miles an hour. And obviously, you had breakdowns from time to time. And this is a ship that was dedicated and made for the fair. This is a whaleback steamer called the Christopher Columbus. Everybody laughed because it looked silly and it looked like it would tip over. But in fact, it was the fastest ship on the Great Lakes. It had walnut paneling on the inside. It had aquariums with fish in there. It was the way to go. The Christopher Columbus. Fastest boat on the Great Lakes. Later on, it was to go to Milwaukee and other places, but this was the main boats they used. The question was asked about the other boat companies. They did service from time to time, but the major part of it came from here. And over at the uh, other side there, they got what they call a Valado Did, which was the place where Christopher, Lumba, Christopher Columbus died. It was a convent in Spain. He died there on May 1st, 1506. So they made that replica right here. Here's some people holding their hats. They are on the lakefront, and uh, they have, but this is the inside of that convent that they made where he died. Well, we're getting into Michigan again, which is just great. We go into the uh, products they had, the, the anthropology. A Michigan sanitarium displays models of its buildings and articles therein contained, especially as to the styles of dress considered most healthful for women and best adapted for their physical development. And that uh, probably was Kellogg, is what they're referring to there. As far as livestock, was noted for the finest horses and sheep. And they had all kinds of sheep and swine, and uh, they competed with Ohio, Missouri, and so forth, and they came on the top. So they excelled in both the uh, cattle, the horses, standard trotters, thoroughbreds, horses, and ponies, and harness with equipments. Entries were made from Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Iowa, and Michigan. So they were very big on that. But the biggest part after copper, of course, was forestry, and this is a forestry building. Michigan being a major player in lumbering, its displays at the forestry building were notable, and that's from the guidebook. To the northeast of the vestibule are evidences of Michigan's forest wealth. A rustic gateway gives entrance to the exhibit. The cabinet which encloses it being highly polished and neatly paneled bird's eye, maple, oak, elm, walnut, and other varieties over there. Over the main entrance is a symbol of the state, two stags engaged in combat with an eagle in between and all the specimens we mentioned. And it said the furniture factories of Grand Rapids and other cities of southern Michigan find in specimens of walnut, oak, maple, and pine were displayed, one of the secrets of their success. Again, according to the guidebook. Here's an exhibit that got everybody by awe. When they came back around in an electric elevated train, they saw this huge pile of wood. Actually, they added the top part for uh, uh, sensationalism, but in fact uh, they would have that many pieces of wood, and that was the part of the logger camp. They actually had a logging train there to demonstrate how we logged the logs, and we had a logger's camp not far from the 
Machinery hall, the loggers camp, build of logs even to the large chimney of this cabin. In and around the building are specimens of all tools used by Michigan lumbermen from the opening of the first camp down to the present time. The dining room is remarkably neat, as also are the bunks with their frames made of tree limbs. Side track near the model is a lumber train piled high with huge logs. The load weighs nearly 290,000 pounds, contains more than 36,000 feet of lumber, and before being delivered to the railroad of Michigan. So we had a very big display right there, including the fireplace on the inside. And this is a, a, a paradox of the whole thing. No military equipment was allowed in the fair except for Krupp. And we all know about Krupp. He uh, made all the weapons for World War I and World War II against us. And they were allowed to bring their giant guns in there by boat and put them on the, the uh, exhibits, as you see there. Well, as I indicated, the carnival part of it was right there on the midway. And the biggest thing was the Ferris wheel, which is the biggest and the first Ferris wheel anybody ever had. It's probably one of the most famous names in the world, Ferris. He died broke at the age of 35. But this is what he designed, this magnificent Ferris wheel. Nobody wanted that as part of the fair. They thought it was just a, a razzle-dazzle thing. And they didn't want anything to do with it. As a matter of fact, this is what saved them from going into bankruptcy after the fair was over, was the Ferris wheel that you had there. But the very last minute, they said, OK, let's let them build it. So they invested $25,000 and made the Ferris wheel. This is the one you see in Navy Pier. And this is the one that uh, we had. 36 passenger cars, 26 feet long, 13 feet wide, 9 feet high. 38 chairs provided for each car. And this is Mr. Ferris, probably the most famous name in the world, and uh, died broke it. The whole idea of Ferris wheel was to compete with the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower is still here, and the Ferris wheel didn't last too much longer. There's the axle of the Ferris wheel. Wood paneling covered the walls and plush revolving seats. They even had a wedding in there with a grand piano in one of them. This was so perfect, it didn't have one flaw all the time it was at the World's Fair here. It was taken down, put together at the St. Louis Fair, no flaws there. When they destroyed it, it took two tons of dynamite just to try to destroy it. It was just fantastic. Some people went no place else except to the fair to go on the Ferris wheel. It was, it was a big thing. This is a mechanism on the inside. This is a ticket. Some people, all they did was buy the tickets all day. And this is how you got on. You went up on the ramp. This is the car. And it went around two times. The second time, it would drop the people off and put them on. And this is the view. You never got that view before. There were no airplanes. This is the view you got from on top there, the Ferris wheel. It was impeccable. Mr. Ferris started with a napkin at a dinner party, and they didn't have computers, never had a problem with it. Well, at the Ferris wheel, of course, they had all other kind of uh, exhibits there. Cracker Jack was invented there. The guy that invented Cracker Jack was the first one to add peanuts to the popcorn and not have it all stick together. And when he did that, the uh, salesman that tried it said, boy, that's a Cracker Jack, which was a statement at the time for how wonderful, and that's how the name that stuck. They had many things on the midway besides Cracker Jack. They had uh, tethered balloons. It was from a postcard. They had the sitting bull. This, now, one of the very nasty parts of it, and the same thing in the St. Louis Fair, is how they degraded the people that were put on exhibit. And this was Sitting Bull's cabin just years after the Custard's last stand to uh, kind of uh, downplay Sitting Bull. And that over there. The Indians, again, they were used for a show only. They were disgraced at the, uh, at the fair. Same thing with the people from the South Pacific. A lot of them got flu. They weren't, never saw cold before. They never saw snow. 
People from the Near East couldn't speak English. They had to live outside of the fairgrounds and tents. And they, but they did have Little Cairo, and as you would imagine, a lot of people liked Little Cairo. Germany, of course, they had their big uh, exhibit in the carnival area. Got this huge chapel on the inside. This is on a carnival. This isn't a part of the official fair. And of course, you know what they're doing under that tent there, right? That's the beer tent that they got. And this young couple over here, they'd say, well, let's leave the beer tent and go elsewhere. And that's what they did. And then if you like the Vienna hot dogs, I don't know if you would like to buy it here. I don't think that passed the public health uh, inspection there. I don't think I was, in those days, of course, you didn't care. You had the uh, re-replication of the volcanoes in Hawaii. You had the mural of the Alpine Alps all around you in this one. And this is for the showing off the custom dress of women around the world. Very cultural. But look at the line that you have at the door over there of the men. So, But they had 30 uh, women and they were in regular costumes of the area. That's what they were there to show. But the men on the line probably thought differently. And there they are. They had the uh, submarine place here. People actually got to see a gentleman in a diving suit, very much like the one we have today. And then you had the uh, Hagenbach Circus, which was a huge, huge success. Mr. Hagenbach was still in Germany. But he was under a lawsuit and made a million dollars during the show, and that's in their money. They would have live lions circle around on the roof there 24 hours a day. So people would get excited about wild animals and then they would go inside. Most of the people never got inside. They were just excited about the animals. Hagenbach's trained animals was a real big success. Well, here comes Michigan again. And this is a very uh, uh, big part of it. And this was the academy that came from Michigan. And they stayed there all winter, I mean all summer and uh, were quite the sight to see in their uniforms. And amazingly enough, they never rode horses in their life, but by the time their instructor got done, they were the best horsemen. This is the, uh, from Oakland Lake Village, Oakland County, Michigan, this Michigan Military Academy. The boys paraded throughout the fairgrounds. John Philip Sousa's band played at their graduation exercises at the place there, but they were magnificent horsemen, even though they never, never rode horses before. Over the course of its 30 year history, the Michigan Military Academy had 2,500 enrollments and 458 academy. And they did camp out on the uh, fairgrounds there. And people got to see them march up and down. The Michigan Military Academy, very much in focus. This is a stereo view of them. And this is a John Philip Sousa playing at their graduation exercise. Chicago Day, very big, again, just a few years after Chicago Fire. You had huge crowds out there, special ticket for the occasion. And these are all the people that came out for Chicago Day. This is a Viking ship I told you about. That was a big exhibit. They had Boat Day, where the boats went around one day out of the week. One more tray and I'll try to finish. You've got a couple minutes left, so. I always run over time and I won't this time. I'll just go fast. If you want to read up on it, there's a lot of good literature out on it. This is a tragic thing. They had the cold storage building got on fire during a fair and there were seven firemen trapped on top and the fire never got out. And that was one of the tragic things that the people had a witness during the fair. And this is another thing. They had the Wild East show. You heard of the Wild West show, right? They had all these people from the Near East that were given demonstrations of their proudness on the rifle shooting and the horseback. And people actually really enjoyed it. They were not allowed on the fairgrounds 
They had to sleep on the football fields of the nearby schools in tents. Here's another guy that was turned down of one of the biggest mistakes in the fair. This is Buffalo Bill. He wanted to be part of the fair, and they said, Nix, you don't want anything to do. So he set up down the street. He made money. He made a ton of money. And if he would have been part of the fair, they would have been much further in the black than they were. But they refused to have him, and of course, everybody went to Buffalo Bill show as well. One of the big spectacles was this huge light designed by a German, that uh, engineer. On a clear night, you could see it for 20 miles out, something people had never seen before. And of course, that night, people stayed. They wanted to see all the light, 20,000 incandescent lights by Westinghouse. Imagine if you never saw a light bulb in your life and you go down there and this is what you see. Even a Ferris wheel was lit up. Souvenirs, uh, people bring me souvenirs from time to time of all the wonderful, this is a silk hanky box. They have porcelain ware, pottery, bookmarks, and then a nickel over here. Well, the thing is, uh, the fair was all over, and uh, they did make money thanks to the Ferris wheel. Uh, but the problem they had, how do you get rid of 20,000 tons of iron and steel, 30, 000, 30 million feet of lumber, and 22 million bricks? And then all the glass, 1,400,000 glass. They couldn't figure it out, and they were only going to get 10% of their return on it. But as fortune would have it, there was a fire that uh, destroyed part of the fair just after it was closed. The peristyle was burned down. Again, it's just plaster and plaster and lath. And this is what the peristyle, that magnificent column thing. They did have the rest of the fair after it was closed. It was there. And there she is. The peristyle is all burned down. Then later they had the big fire the following July. Nobody knows how they started. They had a lot of vagrants would be uh, sleeping around there. You gotta keep in mind this stucco turned into black, cracked, ugly, moldy stuff on the buildings. It wasn't that shiny white stuff anymore. So it was kind of a uh, blessing in a way that uh, it ended as it did, but the rest of the thing burned down. They didn't have to worry about uh, how to get rid of the material. But they did have a lot of uh, poetry written. It says it has gone all of its glory, greatest of the fair and grand, but trill live in a song and story mid the memories of our land. And this is what was left of it. Well, what does it look like today? Well, this is what it looked like then. This is what it looked like in the 50s in Chicago. They had the Nike missile things there in the 50s. And today you can walk behind the Museum of Science and Industry. You can see the Clarence Darrow monument over there. He had his ashes spread over the lagoon. Of course, he got the Museum of Science and Industry, the only remaining building other than the Art Institute. This is the way it looked in the old days. This area over here, you can take a walk in back of the Jackson Park. This is what it looks like. This is what was there. This is it now. This is what was there. And one of the things that Olmsted did, he tried to make the land look as natural as when they took it over. So they reverted back to the, uh, the wild look. This is a uh, bridge over to the Japanese garden in Woodland. Now people are fishing there. But they, they're trying to bring it back to nature. They have a group out there that uh, are trying to it's called the uh, the lagoon over there. It's, it's just like I say, they're trying to bring it back to what it was. There is what was there. It, now it's that. It was there. Amazing. You go over to the Wooded Island where they have the uh, uh, Japanese exhibit. The Wooded Island still is there just like in the original time. And you can walk across the bridge. 
See Japanese gardens, not the original ones, but the ones that were there. That's what you see today, that uh, Bobolink uh, Prairie is what they're building out there. This is a museum we know today. We go on the other side, but in fact, that was the front of it. Well, what happened to the midway that was there? Well, if you look from the air, this was where the fair was. This is where the midway is. This is where University of Chicago, Washington Park. This is the way it looked after the midway was done. They were going to think about putting a canal in there that never came to fruition. Now it's called the Midway Pliance Park, and that's used for uh, the college. This is University of Chicago. They play a lot of football out there. I mentioned the postcards. You still see postcards in the 30. The German building still stood. This was called the Fields Columbia Museum. What Fields did, he built his new museum in Grand Park, and then he just let this rot until somebody came by and said, let's make that into the Museum of Science and Industry. That's when they added that stone facade and set it a plaster and made the beautiful museum you see today. You can see a small replica of the uh, uh, statue that was in the middle of the title thing in the park. If you go to Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, you can still see the Norway exhibit that's in Blue Mounds. Again, the Art Institute, that was the planning session. That's still there, of course. And this is the Valley Lloyd. This is where the convent that uh, uh, Columbus supposedly died in, a postcard showing it was still there in the 30s along with the uh, ships. And now this is what they have. This is the end of that. The Viking ship, I mentioned that. That's now in the Geneva, Illinois Park. If you want to see that, they're trying to... Tiffany's. Tiffany has a big exhibit in the manufacturing building. This is the way it looks like in Pennsylvania if you ever get out there. Well, the Ferris wheel, what happened to that? They took it all down. They took it to the St. Louis Fair. After two years, they blew it up. It took them two chances to blow it up the way you see. There's one part left on a low bridge over a river by St. Louis. That's one only part left. And somebody mentioned something about the White City. After the fair was gone, Every city in the United States tried to replicate it by making a white city. In Chicago, it was over by College Grove. And this is how I got into the whole thing in the first place, because my mother remembered going to this. That was open all the way to 1955. They had the chutes. They had roller coasters. So with that being the end of the thing, Harry, sorry for the time, but uh, I hope I got your curiosity going. Read up on it. There's a lot of material out there. Thank you for sharing the time. Thank you.